Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I have a very exciting video for you, something I've been waiting so long to do. And today is the day that we set up a swatch book, kind of like a bullet journal, but for swatching and color mixing. So today I have the beautiful Stratmore Vision Mixed Media Sketchbook. I chose this one specifically because well, it has 70 pages, so that's a lot. I will be able to use it for so long and have all of my swatches in one place. Also, this is a mixed media sketchbook because yes, I plan on swatching watercolors a lot, but I have other mediums that I want to swatch. So I did not want to use a watercolor sketchbook because I felt like the paper wouldn't suit all these other mediums. This is a 9 by 12 inch size sketchbook, which is pretty big. I have a lot of watercolors and I want to be able to see as many as I can on one page. This is 160 GSM paper, so it's... Well, we will see how absorbent it is. I don't know yet. This first page I'm going to leave as is for now. I might create some artwork here at some point. These pages will be the table of content. So I thought that in general, I could have like a two centimeter header. For you people um, with the imperial system in inches, well, I have no idea what that is. But you know, two centimeters, it's a bit less than an inch, right? I thought that if I write quite small, I think that two pages will be enough for my table of content. And maybe I could just like do a margin on this side or should I split it in half? Yes. I'm treating it as a bullet journal because I have a table of content, I will have a key, I will have some page setup examples. Then I'll be able to do whatever I want. It's going to be flexible but I plan on having as much resources as I can in these first few pages. I try to make the title a bit prettier, <laughs> going back over it with my favorite Castel Pit artist pen. So this is my nice writing. I really don't know how to do beautiful calligraphy, so... Oh, well. Now, I think I will maybe create some lines. Six millimeter lines. I'll just do a couple and I will do more when I have more stuff to write down. And once I've written down all my points, then I will just erase the lines. I used to have a bullet journal and I really liked setting it up, doing the research for it. At that time, also I had a, a lot of passion for makeup products so I and skincare. So I had a big table full of all the things that I was trying out and my impressions and my reviews. And I spent so much time setting it up. And in the end, I feel like, I remember trying to plan some stuff with my friends or for school and not having my bullet journal with me at all times really was a nuisance. It really hindered my ability to plan my life. And I just ended up switching to Google calendars and the rest of the things that I used to do in my bullet journal, like all the tables and like habit trackings and stuff like that, I just stopped doing. Also, I remember trying to set up each week on the Sunday before and I never had time and, you know, I tried. Okay, so I'll write my first page, which is going to be the key on page four. And let's jump to the key right now. I'm just going to trace my header at two centimeters from the top. Okay, so the key here is going to be about things that are related to art materials. 
this is not a planner. I don't need anything related to um, is that task done? Is it still to do? What is in the future? Nothing like that. It's not a planner. So what I want to do is just create a system to note art materials information like light fastness, staining, granulation, transparency, and series number. First, we have light fastness. I think I will do three here, two here. I'm always writing down stuff with my graphite pencil first so I can see if what I'm writing down is centered or not. Let's start with the staining because it's the one right in the middle. This key is going to be useful a lot for watercolors and maybe not for all of the other mediums, but this is fine. I don't mind if it's not as useful for the other mediums. gonna have to tell me what the difference between semi-transparent and semi-opaque is because for me it's like a glass half full or half empty it's pretty much the same but maybe it's not I just couldn't really find any information about that and some brands just have one or the other some brands have both so what does it mean the reason why I put semi-transparent and semi-opaque in my sketchbook is that I will write down when the brands say one or the other and then maybe we'll time um, with my swatches. I will find what the difference is. Maybe not, but we'll see. So I will just write down an example of the order in which I will write this all this information down for each color when i have the information available of course if the information is not there i will just skip that one and now for this bottom part what i want to do is that brands can have different symbols to talk about all these elements and it's kind of complicated sometimes when you get a new tube and you have some random numbers, you're not sure what they mean. And you have to go to the website and you have to find the chart. So I wanted to put all the information about the brands that I have right now in here already and translate them into my key that I'm going to use. It's just going to uh, accelerate the process of swatching and finding information. So let's start with the table. Okay, so I cleaned it up a little bit. And here is going to be my information from my key up here. And then in this part is going to be the translation. watercolors for the first time. Um, I'm going to take this graphite color that I hated when I swatched it. I'm going to paint every other line with this color. I want it to be very pale so I can separate each brand. That's what I want to do. Let's put a little bit of graphite in here. I'm happy I get to use it because I hate this color usually. Yeah, I think it's gonna be good. So let's see how the paint reacts to this paper. The first test. So I can still see a little bit of the lines that I erased. 
so that's good because I did not want to draw them with my black pen but I still wanted to see them a little bit I really like the uneven look of this it's really it has a feel of a, an art book which is what it is so I like this very much so far So while this dries here, let's start working on this page. This page is going to be a watercolor slash ink swatch page setup. So this is just a suggestion. It's something I thought I could do, but I don't have to follow it. I just want to have an example somewhere that I can follow if I ever want to. I would like to put the page number somewhere here, so I will just move this a little bit aside. Okay, fast forward a little bit. I just went over all my pencil lines and I wrote down the title, I wrote down the page number. I think I'm going to write the page number only on this side because there's no need to write it on both pages. So I did these lines um, that aren't full because in reality, I won't trace lines like this in my sketchbook. Well, I will with my pencil just to know how much area I have for each swatch, but I will erase them at the end. So I wrote down also the uh, dimensions for each rectangle for the title area um, so I know that each swatch have an area of 9.5 centimeters by 3.8 I wanted to organize my swatch area let me zoom you in this is the 9.4 by 3.8 centimeters area so the swatch will not be that big it will only be a uh, part of that because on top I want to have some room to write the name of the color, the pigments and the symbols that I wrote down in my key right here. And then I want to have a dispersion test. I will explain all of it to you but first let's just draw this in here and then I will tell you all about this elaborate swatch. <laughs> Okay, so this may seem complicated and maybe it is, especially right now with all the dashed lines, which won't be here in my real swatches. Now on this first rectangle here, I have this first top area, which will be the mass tone. This means that this will be the undiluted color. This will be like the, the true color. I will first do a black line here and I will cover it with the watercolor and this will allow me to see how opaque this watercolor is. If it covers the line completely, then the watercolor is opaque. If I can see the line through the watercolor, then it will be transparent or semi-transparent. When the watercolor is dried, I will draw another black line on top this time, just to see the difference between the two lines. Here I will add some water and then I will do a gradient. For this little part here, this is where I will test the dispersion of the paint. So I will um, put some water in this whole rectangle here. I will just put a dot of color here and see how it spreads. Because some paints spread more than others and it's a good information to have depending on what I'm trying to achieve. The only other thing that I will do is a lift test. So I will reserve an area here. When the paint is dry, I will put some water and try to lift the color. This will tell me how staining the paint is. If I can lift it completely, then the paint is not staining, non-staining. And if I can't lift it or if it stains, well, I will know how much it does. Now, I think we can go back to our key page because it's now dried and I will be able to work on 
the table that I did. So I have Daniel Smith things. So here you can see that the Daniel Smith is very is the same for the light fastness and staining, but for granulation they say yes or no. Um, and for the transparency, it's a circle and they only have the semi-transparent. They don't have semi-opaque. So maybe for them, it's the same. Windsor Newton, they have the same, but they also have some like ABC information, which is permanence. So I read that when they don't have the one, two, three, four um, system, you can see if they wrote ABC. So I will write both. So they have one two, three, four, and they also have five. The one, two, three, four refers to a specific test that is the reference for all paints. But when they haven't tested it in this specific standardized way, then you can see their ABC grade, which is something proper to Windsor & Newton. I think for the professional paints, you can see the one, two, three, four, no problem. But I think for the Cotman or their student grade paints, then sometimes you have the ABC system with the one, two, three, four system, or sometimes you only have the ABC system. So that's why it gets confusing. So for now, this is what I have. This is the system I decided to use and this is the system that companies use. So I will be able to translate their system into mine very easily with this chart. So when I get more colors with more brands, then I will be able to fill in the rest. I could do an example here. That would be very pretty. I think I will do that right now before we move on to something else. Right, so I will test two colors in here. I have one already in here that I will just test right now. So this one is Daniel Smith Rare Green Earth Pigments is Rare Green Earth, so I won't write it down. So I will put some water, leaving a space for the mastone. I'm quite excited to see how the paint is going to react with this paper. dispersion test see how it goes and we will try another color this one why not vermilion from Van Gogh and I will find the information about the color a bit later Let's do a dispersion test and we will wait for them to dry. It's a couple of hours later. I tried to lift some paints and both paints allowed me to do it. So it's good to know. I can see a nice granulation in this one and in this one I don't see any, which is what I expected considering the symbols. I have to say that this paper is not made for watercolor specifically so it doesn't absorb too too well so i have to be careful not to put too much water on the sheets because when i do that you can see that the water well the paper buckles a little bit it warps it waves and so the water can spread from one swatch to another because they are quite close together so maybe i will try to do smaller swatches but we will see now we are going to move on to the sixth page, which is about color theory. Let's give ourselves 
a two centimeter header. Okay, so during my research, I read something that was very interesting and it was about the primary colors and how mixing them can help you create some really vibrant colors or some muddy colors. And I took a little bit of notes. I wanted to do a little page on the subject in my swatch book just to remember this information that I found. So I read about the three dimensions of color. I just wanted to write them down real quick. You have hue, which can refer to the wavelength. You have value, which refers to how dark or light the color is. The third one is chroma, which refers to the saturation. So I'm going to do three circles um, with the primary colors. So blue, red, and yellow. The first row will be cool colors and the second will be warm colors and then we will see how they react when we mix them. So we will start with Van Gogh Permanent Lemon Yellow. I'm just doing a small circle like this. Okay. Then the cool red which will be Windsor and Newton cadmium red hue. It does not look that cool right now, but compared to the other red that I will put down, I think this one is a little bit cooler. But that's all that I have, so that's what I'm gonna use. And I will put down a cool blue, which will be um, Van Gogh pale blue. Then we will go with the warm colors. I will put the Van Gogh Cobalt Blue, then the Warm Red Van Gogh Vermilion, and a Warm Yellow, which will be Windsor Newton Cadmium Yellow Hue. These are two versions of the same colors. These are the warm tones and these are the cool tones. And how to find out if you're looking at a cool tone or a warm tone is to look at the undertone. So for example, let's look at the two yellows here. This one is a bit cooler because there's more blue in it. It tends more towards a green. And this one has a bit more red in it and it tends more towards the orange, so it's a bit warmer. Let's look at these two reds. This one is a bit warmer because there's a bit more yellow in it. It tends more towards an orange. And this one is a bit more cool because you can see there's more blue in it. So it tends more towards a purple than this one. This one has a bit more yellow in it and it tends more towards a green. And this one has a bit more red in it and it tends more towards a purple. So according to what I've read, and the videos I've watched. If you want to create a vibrant color with a mix of these, you need to mix two colors that tend towards the same color. So let's say you wanted to create a green with a blue and a yellow. If you mix this one and this one, you see that they don't tend towards the same. This one leans towards an orange and this one leads towards a purple, you're gonna get a muddy color. But if you mix these two, this one tends towards a green and this one tends towards a green, you're gonna get a vibrant color. But if you wanted to get a vibrant purple, then maybe it would be better for you to mix a cool red that tends towards a purple with a warm blue that tends towards a purple as well. So it's things like that that you need to think about when you really want to create vibrant colors. And I have to say that I have never really thought about these things as I really like muddy colors in general, but I think it's a good thing to know. So now let's try to mix these colors together a little bit. Let's mix the cool tones together first.
Let's do the same but with the warm colors this time. Here we should get a vibrant orange because our two colors tend to are the same, which is an orange. Yes, you can see that this orange here is a lot more vibrant than this thing here that we got. So when we look at the colors, we can see that we have a very vibrant orange here because our two warm colors that we mix tend towards an orange. So we have a very vibrant one. This one is a lot more muddy because the cool yellow tends towards a green and the cool red tends towards a purple. So they don't want to make an orange. They want different things in life. So they made this muddy orange. Same here because our cool red wants to make a purple and our cool blue wants to make a green. So muddy color. But here we get a vibrant green because our cool yellow wants to make a green and our cool blue wants to make a green as well. And we can see here that our purple that we get here is a bit muddy because of this reason and our green here is a bit muddy as well because of this reason. Let's just try to mix a vibrant purple because we have two muddy purples here. So if I look at this, I should mix a cool red with a warm blue. So let's try it. I don't think I had a, a red that was very, very cool. Maybe that's why this purple here is still a bit muddy. I think it's because this red might not be cool enough. It looks like this one. I think it's because these two are very similar. Well. We need to try it again at some point, but still it's very interesting. And that's just what I wanted to put on this page. Just a visual reminder of what color mixing can be like, depending on the cool or warm tones that you choose. So this is what this page will look like for now. Maybe I'll add some more tests here at some point, but I just wanted to add that there's nothing wrong with making a muddy color. You don't always want vibrant colors. Sometimes you want to muddy them on purpose. And with this, now you know how to achieve that. Or if you want to create a vibrant color, you also know how to achieve that effect. So it's just a way of having more control over the colors you mix. Now let's work on this page, which is still under color mixing theme. This thing that we are going to do here is watercolor mixing charts ideas. I just wanted to put some examples in this sketchbook. So when I want to make a mixing chart, then I have some quick ideas of what I could do. All right, so these are my two charts. I will have one more, but I will start with these two. This is the one by one and the two by one chart. Okay, let's say that you have these, these three colors and you want to mix them to see what they look like. We could write their names down, but we will just put a dot. These are going to be two ways of doing the, the charts. All right, so what we will do is that we are going to mix this one with this one, this one with this one, this one with this one. See, so it works with rows and columns. These two mix together, so this square here is the first color. These two here mix together, they meet here, so this is going to be the second color and this is going to be the third color. So I'm just gonna fill these up right now. So these are really small charts, but I could do some with like five colors, six colors, any amount of colors that I want. The more colors I use, the bigger the chart is going to be. What we will do is that we will mix now these two together with an equal ratio, one per one. So I'm gonna put in this thing here, 
as much of the pink as the burnt sienna and do a little mix. Now the thing is, as you can see, this mix is gonna come again right here. So we don't want to have the same colors. So this one, I'm going to dilute it a lot more just to see what the diluted version looks like. So I'm going to repeat the same thing with the other colors. So I got this color here and I am going to dilute the same version here. Here we go, and then we're gonna do the our last two. So that's it. You can see that the colors on this side of the mixing chart are a lot paler than the colors on the top part. So these are the same colors, but the values are different. Um, some people think that you're kind of duplicating the same information, which is a waste of space, a waste of time. And if you think that, well, fine. Um, I think this, this is interesting. I think most of all, this is fun. Um, so I see no problem in doing that, but there's another version that you can do, which is a bit different. So instead of mixing um, the same amount of paint, you're going to take the columns and for each column, you're going to mix two parts for one part of each row. For example, here, you're going to mix two parts burnt sienna, which is this brown color here, with one part Carmine here, this pink here. Here, you, you won't get the same thing because now the column is the carmine and the row is the burnt sienna. So you're going to mix two parts carmine and one part burnt sienna. So you're going to get different colors. So that's what we'll do. Let's try with this here first. One, two, then one. This carmine is very strong. It's a very beautiful color, I love it. And now let's do the opposite right here. So I'm gonna mix two parts carmine with one part burnt sienna. So the colors are similar, but they're not exactly the same. Now let's work on these two. So for the this one, I'm going to add two parts painted gray with one part carmine. And then I'm going to mix this one. I'm going to put twice as much carmine than paint gray. So you can see that we get very different colors and it's super interesting. These colors are amazing, but I need more room. So I need to get rid of them. Such a shame. But now I know how to mix these because of my mixing chart. Okay, so now let's mix these two here. Love this color. And then I'll do this one. That's the difference between these two color mixing charts. So here we have different information in every square compared to here, but here we have different values. So that's interesting as well. So I feel like it just depends on what you're looking for, but these are two good options. A color mixing chart like this can be like 
intense like this. Like if you have 12 colors, you have 12 columns and 12 rows. So it makes a super big chart. Okay, so this is the two or three color variations. It would be a two color variation if we only had this top row, but we can add a third color and I'm going to demonstrate it. Uh, but I'll only use some color pencils because it's gonna be quicker and easier to visualize, I think. So let's say that we want to mix this blue um, with this green. Weird choice, I know. <laughs> so color one will be blue. Color two will be green, this bright green. The second column will be the same color as this one, but a more diluted version, a little bit like this. So that's just represented by doing this. And same thing here. Here is going to be a one for one ratio. So we will have one of the blue with one of the green mixed together, of course. And this one is going to be the same thing, but a more diluted version. Here will be a two per one ratio. So two blues. Let's do the less diluted version as well at the same time. For one green. And this will be the one per two version. So one blue per two greens. Always mix together. I'm just doing these dots so it's easier to see. We will get a row of colors that go slowly from blue to green. More and more green as we go. So that's uh, the two color variations right here with a difference in values as well. But let's say that now we want to add a third color. We want to add this yellow. So what we will do is that we are going to add more and more yellow as we go down the rows. So it's always going to be the same. One blue and one yellow. One blue and two yellows. And then you guessed it, one blue and three yellows. And then we go fill these up again. This is two blues, one green, all the way, okay? Instead of doing like a super huge chart with 12 colors and you only see like one mix with each color, now you can really see a range. You take two colors and you can really see the full range to get from one color to the other. And then you can also add to that with another color. So it adds one more dimension. So these are just three examples of color mixing charts that I will be able to do in this swatch book going forward. Okay, so now I'm going to start another page, which is going to be about color wheels. I'm sorry about the noise that you might be hearing right now. I think it's a very busy time in my apartment building. People are very active right now. And it's an old building, so you might hear some creaky floors. So first of all, I wanted to draw two color wheels that I thought were very interesting. Well, in fact, there's gonna be three color wheels. We're gonna start with the first two right now. So everything I'm doing right now of course, it's optional if you just want like a swatch book to do your swatches and that's it, then it's very unnecessary. Everything I'm doing right now is just that I got super inspired during my research. I wanted everything to be well organized. And then I found some super interesting things, just like these color wheels, these mixing charts that I wanted to write down somewhere. So I thought that in this swatch book would be the perfect place to do that. Hmm. 
now we are done with the sketching part um, okay so this first one is the classic color wheel the one that you've already probably seen so in here we will have the three primary colors the yellow red and blue and the mixes that we can obtain from these three colors this one is a mixture of three colors so in here we would have color one color two and color three we would create a gradient with the colors going towards the center so this ring here would be the most vivid color and then we would dilute it more and more until we get to the center so let's say we this is color one and this is color two well this one would be a mix of the two colors so it would allow us to try out different mixes and see our gradient as well at the same time this one is a bit more complicated so each of the colors on the outside ring are a different color so for example I could put all of the colors that I have in one palette let's say this one is a green and this one is a red this line here would be a mix of the two colors so this is only green let's say in this square here we would have mostly green but with a touch of red and in this one we would have mostly green but with more red and this one some green and more red always more and more red until we get here and in this one it will be the same but opposite so this here would be red this square here would be more red but with a touch of green and this one will be still more red but with a bit more green and so on and so forth this wheel here mixes a lot of colors and you can see a lot of different ranges of colors a lot of options this one may be a bit more complicated than the others but i think it would be fun to try it at least once okay so we will start with the traditional color wheel and we will fill it up we will start with the yellow the red and the blue oh and I forgot that this part of the circle is also the primary color so now I just want to make sure that the blue doesn't touch the yellow or the red because I don't want them to mix together because these paints are not dried yet Now I'm going to create the tertiary colors here, which here is going to be a purple, a green and an orange. So we will start with the orange first. I like this purple a lot. So now I'm going to do this color in between. I'm gonna add a bit more blue to this green here, but just a tiny bit because I don't have a lot of green. Look, now the colors will merge together. Okay, so this is the primary wheel, the color wheel that we are most used of seeing, I feel like. This is maybe something that you've seen when you were in art class in school. I know that I have and it's always fun to do this exercise again after this many years. Now I think I'm just gonna reuse these to do the second color wheel because I don't want to waste any paint. So let's say that this one is color 1, this one is color 2, this one will be color 1 plus color 3, color 
three plus color two, color one plus color two. So I think that I'm going to use this one as color one. This one would be color two. I'm usually not a big fan of orange. Well, I'm still not, but I had a lot of this one, so I figured I might as well use it. And then let's use this bright greenish yellow. I have no idea what the mixes are going to be like. I think they might be interesting. These two lighter colors here, they really look like pretty much the same. That's fine. Now I'm going to mix these here, which is going to create a quite a weird color, I think. Now let's read this last color mix. I feel like this looks like a yellow ochre. I've never explored purposefully with colors like this before, so it's very interesting. And it definitely makes me want to do this kind of exercise more. Okay, so now I'm just gonna do an example with this color wheel. I'm not going to fill it up entirely because it would be too long and I would need to create too many colors. I just want to have like one example so I remember what this color wheel is if I don't use it in a couple of months. So I'm going to use this color that I have right here as one of the starting colors on this side. And then I'm going to need another color on the other side. I think like this bluish gray would be fine. So we're gonna put it on the opposite side. So what I will do on this plate here is create my mixes. So the first color I'm going to create is the one that's going to go there in which I will mix a tiny amount of this red orange. And with each color mix, I'm going to add more and more of this color. Then I'm going to create the same thing, but starting with a red base and adding more and more blue to the mix, but always having more of this red base than the blue. The mixes I'm going to create should be different from one another. So here it is. You could imagine what the result would be with different colors all over the circle. This is enough to understand the concept. It's more like a mixing chart. I don't know if I will do this one too often because I feel like these colors could repeat themselves a little bit. Still, it was fun to do and this is something that is going to be an option if I ever want to do something like this. All right, so now we will start the last page I wanted to do in preparation in this sketchbook, in this swatch book. One last page for swatches for paints that are not fluid, for acrylics, for gouache, or for anything else that would fit. Hello, voiceover me with my cat who's purring right now. So I hope that you like the ASMR. 
So I was explaining to you what I did right now, but I forgot to turn on my mic. So I'm going to tell you right now. Um, first of all, what I did, just like the other swatches, is that I reserved space for the name of the paint, for the pigments, and a space for the paint information that I would want to write down. After that, I decided that I would separate my swatching area into three different areas. This right side is reserved for the gradient. This middle part would be for the mass tone, so I would not put any water there, and it would allow us to see the true color of the paint, and then we would have a gradient. And this left part would be reserved for layering. What I like to do when I paint and what I like to practice is to do more mixed media. So I want to know what I can layer on my paint. So I thought it would be a good idea to reserve a space for layering exploration. For example, if I get an acrylic marker, I could layer it on top of my paint and just see what it looks like. Then I drew a dark line to do an opacity test, just like I did with my previous swatches. So I'm going to paint on top of it and see if it shows through. Then I'll know how opaque the paint is. And finally, the last thing I did on this page is just to write down the dimensions of everything so I could easily reproduce it if I decide to do a page like this. To finish up this video, I thought it could be very interesting to swatch all my Daniel Smith's watercolors. So far I have eight of them, but I did this whole page because I am planning on having enough to fill it up. So it's going to be a goal to get more Daniel Smith watercolors in the future. I thought that I could group them by colors a little bit. So I have my greens here my blues here and my earth tones here. So I'm going to write everything down, speed up this footage maybe a little bit, and then we can swatch together. down all of the names, I wrote down the pigments, and I wrote down the information that I could find on the colors. So I think we can start. I'm very excited because there are three that I have never swatched before because I was waiting for this video. Now you are zoomed in on the top row. I will start with the burnt yellow ochre. see the mass tone and now we will start mixing this color with the water more and more and see how it behaves it's supposed to be granulating so I'm excited to see how it's gonna dry and now I'm going to move on to the next color to be honest, I thought that the burnt yellow ochre would be a bit more on the yellow side because at the store there were some swatches next to each color and it was a lot more yellow. So now I'm thinking maybe it's going to look a lot like the quinacridone sienna that I'm going to swatch right now. Oh yeah, the difference is big. What a beautiful color, wow. And it's very reactive with the water. It's amazing. Love this color. Well, I love both of these. This one is very surprising to me. Well, both of these are surprising, in fact. But I love them both. Now let's swatch Tiger Eye Genuine. 
It's funny because all of the colors that I have from Daniel Smith are transparent colors. And it's very, it's just a coincidence. It's not intentional at all. I'm looking forward to try other types of colors, other types of opacities to see what the difference is, how they behave. But yeah, Tiger Eye is very transparent and I can see it right away. Now we will try the blue, Mayan Blue Genuine. So I can really see the transparency because I really see all of my brush strokes. Same with the tiger eye. Normally I would use it with more water because that's not necessarily an effect that I am particularly liking, but it's good to know. Let's see how it spreads. Oh, it spreads a lot. Now let's move on to the Blue Appetite Genuine. So beautiful. And on to our last blue. Ooh. I think this is what Natasha Newton would call a sexy color. I love how it's already starting to spread. Very deep. I think I'm going to put the dot in the middle from now on because they're too close to the swatches and I feel like the water here, sometimes it, it spreads too much, more than I want to and oh yes, so much more satisfying to see this. All right, so only two to go. The greens, we'll start with sap green. This is such a beautiful color. I love warm greens. And you can already see how it's starting to spread. Onto our final color, Rare Green Earth. Oh, I didn't show you the whole thing. So these are all of my Daniel Smith watercolors. I really love the colors. They are so beautiful and so different from one another. And it's so nice to be able to see them all on one page. I think that these watercolors are super beautiful, especially when mixed with a lot of water. I think that this concludes this video on my swatch book setup. This is going to be a super valuable tool for me, I think. And I can't wait to swatch some more and have fun with the sketchbook. So if we just go back to the pages that we did, excuse this messy table. So we have the table of contents right here. I added all the pages that I did and I left some blank space here because I left some blank pages before starting the swatches because I know that I'm gonna add some more stuff in here. We have the key here that I used with my swatches that you just saw. I have an example of a watercolor or ink swatch setup, which is what I did in the watercolors that you saw. I have a page about some basic color theory, nothing too complicated and with some examples. I have some mixing charts that I could do if I wanted to, some examples. I have some color wheels that I can play around with. 
And another kind of swatch page example that I would be able to play with. So these are the pages that I left blank here. And the watercolors. Oh, and we forgot one thing. I wanted to do a lift test for each of these. So I'm gonna zoom you in a little bit and we will just try to lift the colors. See how possible it is. Oh my God. So we can really see that the number that I wrote right here, which represents the staining quality of the paints, matches quite a lot with what we can see. So this one is non-staining and we can really see that the paint lifted completely. Same thing with this one, the paint lifted a lot. And with these, the paint stained a little bit. And with these, these are three. So they stain a bit more and we can see it. So thank you for watching this video, for being with me in this swatch book organization. I hope you liked it. I hope you found it interesting. And don't hesitate to tell me if there's anything that I could put in these first pages, interesting information that I could add in these pages, or if you have some links you want to send me or some references for me to see, I would love to make this swatch book even more useful and interesting. And if you have a swatch book, please tell me what you do, how you use it. Please share. I would love to be able, well, I would love to have more information about how you do your own swatch book. Thank you again. I will see you soon. And in the meantime, take care. Bye.